Hey guys, thanks for coming and checking out this fourth video called The Man of Grace. I want to first lay some uh, uh, philosophical foundations before we start talking about uh, the, the, the topic of this video. And I want you to, to think about uh, this fact that through our experience, we discover all kinds of laws, whether they're in nature, like physical laws, or in their in logic, like abstract laws, maybe in the realm of mathematics. What I want you to realize uh, and, and contemplate is that we didn't dis we didn't create these laws. They're not a matter of convention. They can't change. Those laws are something that we discover, and that we might make mistakes in describing them. We might learn more about them, but they're fixed, and we discover them. Um, so here's two examples. Obviously, the the, the law of gravity uh, is a natural law that we observe, and we might uh, have made mistakes in the past how it works, but it didn't mean that the law, you know, two people might have disagreed about how that law worked. It didn't mean that there were two laws. It just meant that we are imperfect at perceiving those laws. Um, but the law exists, and it's a cold law, meaning it doesn't change, it's fixed. And similarly, like this logic example as well, when we read this, it says the blue button is true. And then we go to read the blue button, it says the red button is false. Well. Uh, well, one of these is, uh, this is a contradiction, right? We, we know that our minds like almost hurts our brains to think about because our brains understand that the laws of logic are fixed and our brains are, are designed to conform to the laws of logic. Uh, another example is uh, in your car, in your garage right now, if there is a car there, well, then it can't be the fact that there's not a car there. So there can't be both a car in your garage and not a car in your garage at the same time in the same sense. Now this law of non-contradiction is, is obviously true and it would take a very uh, wise person, a very intellectual person to try to explain it to be false. But we discover these laws and that's what I want what I want you to see first of all. And the next thing I want you to know is, uh, is to, to understand is no matter how much we believe in a lie, meaning no matter how much we disagree with the law, reality has a way of exposing the truth. So we can operate in error. We do it all the time as humans. We have imperfect perceptions of the law that doesn't change reality. Uh, picture my friend here walking towards the end of this cliff. He can wholeheartedly believe that at the end he's going to fly off into the sky. Uh, but here's the thing. If two people were watching this man walk towards the cliff and one of them said, yeah, he's going to fly. And the other one said that he's going to fall, right? Gravity's going to act on his body and he's mass, he's going to be attracted to that to the mass called the earth, it's not going to go well for him. Here's the thing, two people disagree about the law, but it doesn't mean that there are two truths or that, that truth is subjective. Um, it doesn't deny the fact that reality is reality, and this man will, will have to suffer the consequences of aligning himself with the lie instead of the truth about the law. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the, the topic of this video is about a law that we discover written on our hearts that I'm going to call the moral law. Now, again, different tribes and different people groups around the world might disagree on matters of ethics, matters of morality, but it doesn't change the fact that moral laws are also set because the law and order in the natural, it points to the law and order in the supernatural. You wouldn't have these physical laws manifesting and then have a supernatural realm that was just chaos and relative. It, it doesn't follow logically. The fact that we have objective truth on the, in, the, in the material realm, it points to and suggests that objective truth is also in the supernatural or immaterial realms. So even though we might disagree about what is ethical or what is moral, it doesn't change the fact that there is an ultimate standard of morality, an ultimate standard of good, and an ultimate standard of bad. Okay, so now we've built that up. Hopefully that makes sense to you. There, you can study a, this a lot more in, uh, in detail, but I'm just giving you an introduction to it. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, there are two things that all humans intuitively understand about life in this world. Now, uh, some people, as they get older and older and they suppress this truth more and more, they're less aware of it in their life. We're going to talk about why that is a little later. But generally, uh, especially young people who are still uh, pretty new on this earth, they know intuitively, instinctively, these two things. And the first is that there is a moral law. 
in the universe and that we discover it. We don't create it. And the next thing they realize is that we fall short of this law. There is a standard of perfect behavior and humans fall short of this standard. Okay, so uh, so what's the what's what is the conclusion? Well, we know that if there is a moral law, that means that there's a moral law giver. This is who we call God. He would be the benchmark. He would be the standard of perfect behavior. He would be what defines by his nature what is good ethical behavior and what is bad, immoral, unethical behavior. And we know that a judge in a courtroom, if he's a good judge, he doesn't look out at your life and say, uh, oh, all of the you know, good things that you've done, but the judge deals with the bad things that you've done. That is, uh, that is the point of being a judge. So he doesn't, you know, you can come to the judge and say, look, I know that I committed this crime, right? I fell short of your perfect standard, but check it out. I'm a pretty good person. I'm generally good, a nice guy. You know, my good outweighs my bad. Well, we know that a good judge would not uh, excuse the crimes because of the good that you've done, but he would always look at the crimes. It doesn't even matter about your intentions, even if you had the right intentions. If you murder somebody, a good judge will make uh, sure that you're uh, paying the consequence for your action. Well, we know that God is a perfect judge, and a perfect judge will always deal with evil. Uh, love will always deal with wickedness. It won't sweep it under the rug or brush it away like it didn't happen. Um, but the character of love is to, is to honestly faithfully deal with wickedness and to administer justice. Okay, so we're building all this up. Again, we all realize that there is this law, meaning there is this lawgiver, meaning uh, there's this standard, there's this perfect standard of ethical behavior. That's one thing we realize, but we also realize that we fall short of that. Well, so why? Why and, and what do we do about it? Well, why is going to be, I'll answer that in just a second, but first, let's look at sort of what we do about it. And I want to uh, suggest to you that every religion on earth is man's attempt to deal with this problem. Now, I'm defining religion as a system developed by man in order to feel justified before God. Now, different uh, cultures around the world will talk about this concept in a little different ways, but essentially... Every belief system, every religious belief system, atheism included, agnosticism, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, even religious Christianity, things like that. Every religious system essentially is a system that's developed by man. It's not authored by God. And it is, uh, it's a way that man would feel justified before God. And we'll talk, we'll talk about how I grew atheism into that. Um, but essentially, these systems are based on man's effort. They sort of acknowledge that God is judge, like there is a judge, but they foolishly believe that man is able to live up to God's perfect standard. So you might be saying, well, atheism, that's not a religion. H here's what I mean. When I, when I probe an atheist and I say, look, Mr. Atheist, if you died tonight and you stood before the judge, well, what would you say? And the atheist always always gives me the answer when they're just in an open dialogue being honest. They say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a generally good guy. If there is a God, he'll understand why I denied him. He'll understand why I rejected him. He gave me my skeptical mind. He gave me my rationality. He made me a, a critical thinker. You know, he'll understand. He didn't give me enough ed evidence. But you see that that atheist, as well as my agnostic friends who claim you can't know this spiritual truth. I mean, there is a spiritual truth, but you can't, you know, one can't know it. What they all essentially claim is that if they stood before the judge, that in their own effort, they would be justified. So they believe about themselves incorrectly that, that they can live up to God's perfect standard. They believe that they're innocent. Um, and this is a big problem, guys. And all, all, all religious systems take shape, take this shape in some way. Some are more uh, obvious, you know, in Buddhism you might have this, uh, the, the noble path and the eightfold truth that says, hey, look, if you live like this, you're going to reach, uh, you're going to, you're going to kill desire in your life and you're going to reach nirvana. You're going to, you're going to become enlightened. And, uh, and, and you might have Hinduism that's claiming 
that you know just just enough sacrifices pleasing the gods and, and whatnot you might have an, a Muslim man who, who believes that just enough obedience and you'll earn mercy with Allah and but all of these systems and even you have Christians who if I just go to church if I just pay my tithes if I just be a good person then I'll be forgiven uh, and of course the Jew, the Jews who were, who received the law we'll talk about why the law came in a second the Jews who are if I just keep the law then I'll be justified before God all of these systems are relying or trusting in man's effort to stand before a perfect God well first let's say well why did why did God give uh, Moses the law well the law was not meant to be a way for man to stand perfectly before God but the Word of God does tell us why the law came about and that was it was instituted to demonstrate to men that we could not live up to God's perfect standard it was a, meant to be a guide to lead us to look for mercy and grace this is huge guys when God instituted the law the Ten Commandments and the 613 total laws those were a, a, were meant to be a tutor or a school guide that helped us see hey you guys can't do this on your own you need help in the state that you're in you need help well what state are we in this goes all the way back to our uh, our first scene on earth and we are in the Garden of Eden and we sin well when that happened we this event that we've talked about in the past videos called the fall happened what that meant is that from our very first parents Adam and Eve and every single child every single human that's ever been born after that was born into sin meaning that we took on the nature of our first parents we took on a sin nature so it's not because we sin that we are sinners it's because we are sinners that we sin this is crucial to understand we were by one man's disobedience we were made sinners we are utterly hopeless because of our sin nature we are dead in sin on our own so this is why the law was instituted to show man this is God's perfect standard and in the condition that you're in there is no way you can live up to it you are dead in sin okay so so then what well for those of you who want to stand before God on judgment day and, 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 and rest and trust in your efforts you are going to be sorely uh, sorely disappointed and I and we want to talk about this concept of hell or eternal separation from God because it is crucial to understand why we're here what went wrong and our destiny where we're going first I just want to point this out that God is the source of all love joy peace pleasure comfort everything good in our experience comes from God well eternal separation from God is the absolute absence of all these things so the absolute absence of comfort is eternal discomfort never having any comfort the absolute absence of peace you see where I'm going with this is eternal chaos eternal unrest and stress the absolute absence of, of uh, pleasure is eternal pain so the Word of God describes this experience using a few uh, a few images He's, it's described as an eternal lake of fire utter darkness and a bottomless pit now I believe the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that has to do with the tribulation period it's a totally different topic but I'm just gonna zone in on these three that are definitely considered images of hell eternal lake of fire utter darkness and a bottomless pit and now before you turn off the video a lot of people get uncomfortable at this point in the discussion but Jesus taught about hell more than he taught about heaven and we know that he was motivated by love alone and we're going to talk about that in a second but first let me just let me just park on these illustrations what's he trying what's the what's our great teacher trying to to warn us about because he's love and he doesn't want us to end in this place what is he how is he trying to warn us well the eternal lake of fire that speaks of pain that you'll be aware of some people think that when I die I'll just sort of cash out I'll sort of turn off 
I'll be sort of in this. I won't, I'll no longer be, but that's not true. You will be aware of your condition for eternity, which means that after 10,000 years pass in hell, you'll have this thought come across your mind. I just started. I just started. So hell is, is the most inconceivably bad place to be. It's the most lonely place. Utter darkness. That speak, you'll never see something again. We need light in order to see things around us, to see other people, to see anything. Utter darkness speaks of, of just the most lonely experience that you'll ever have. A bottomless pit. Well, guys, this is, this is just awful to think about. But our bodies, in order to stay sane, we need to be able to have our grounding, to like put our hands down or our feet down, to feel grounded. Well, you'll never feel something again. The agony that you'll experience when you're separated from God is so horrible that it moved the Lord Jesus to, to speak about it often, not because he was manipulative, but because he loved people. Let's look at how that, how that pans out. Why does love take that shape? Why does love warn you about operating spiritually in the lie? Well, let's imagine our, our guy who is headed towards the cliff again. What does love do in this situation? Well, I, I suggest to you, if there was two men watching, watching our friend here, we're going to call this man Doug. Doug's walking towards the cliff. If I love Doug, what do I do in that situation? Well, Doug right now is believing incorrectly about his destiny. He's believing that when he walks off the cliff, he's going to fly. So he's in error about the truth. Well, the Western world today might try to tell you that love means just accepting Doug and his worldview. And just tolerating Doug. That his truth is his truth, and your truth is your truth, and keep your truth to yourself. Well, guys, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Love will always passionately plead with Doug to change his mind. Because the error that he's operating in will cause him harm. Love will care enough about Doug that they will intervene in this situation. Okay. Hopefully you guys see that, but this is powerful. This is why you're, you, when, when you're uh, witnessing and when you're being an evangelist to the world, you need to include a discussion about hell. I know it's not popular and you will be attacked for it, but guys, we have to follow Jesus' example. If you truly love people, you will remind them about eternity because eternity is in every man. They already know it exists. They need to be reminded in a loving, gentle way. Okay, let's keep going. Well, what is the gospel? <laughs> the gospel means the good news. And the gospel is the good news that we are saved by God's grace through faith. Now, we're going to look at what that means. But guys, this is truly the best news you have ever heard or will ever hear on this earth. It's the best news to land on planet earth, to enter this atmosphere. It should be the thing that moves us everywhere we go. Paul described the armor of God. He said, you're wearing shoes quickened by the gospel of peace, meaning this should move us in our whole life. Everywhere we go should be a result and a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what is that gospel? Well, first of all, what is grace? Grace is the free and unmerited favor of God. You did not deserve it. It is a gift and you cannot earn it. Every religious system is anti-grace. Even Christianity, when it becomes a religious system, which is very po popular in the, in the West, and the church in the United States in particular, when it becomes a religious system that relies on man's effort to secure justification or salvation, the moment it does that, the moment it trusts in man's effort, it flies in the face of grace. It's rejecting the grace of God. Well, what is faith? Well, faith essentially is recognizing when we recognize that man cannot bridge that chasm between heaven and earth on our own, meaning that we can't reach God's perfect standard. So it starts with utter humility, realizing I can't do it on my own. Faith is simply placing our trust in God's mercy and grace. Another way to think about it is it's choosing to agree with God's word through belief. One of the most powerful things that can happen in your life is being honest with yourself 
about the fact that you choose to believe what you're going to believe. The scientist will say, not me. I let the data direct my beliefs. But I would like to submit to you that all of us are willfully choosing what we will make out of the data. We are willfully choosing what we will believe no matter what the data says, we will fit it to our worldview. An example of this, I can tell my atheist friend, I've seen miracles. I've seen blind eyes open and deaf ears. I've seen videos of thousands of wheelchairs being passed to the front of a meeting. Before the atheist or the, science, this, the person who's fully uh, committed to the scientific method, naturalism and only naturalism, before he even sees my video, guess what? He already knows that all of that is a lie. He already knows that all of that has a natural explanation. He, he's not actually swayed by the data. He doesn't come into the courtroom and say, oh wow, this is convincing. No, he comes into the courtroom with the verdict already in his back pocket. He already comes in with naturalism and says there are no such thing as miracles. There is no supernatural. Therefore, none of this data can convince me in it. So, guys, when you, when you realize that you're choosing what you believe in, this can help you make a right choice about who you're listening to. And the Word of God is the only reliable place to put your faith. Okay, hopefully that, that makes sense and blesses you guys. So, uh, before we, uh, we talk about why the gospel is such good news, or, or, or to help us understand why the gospel is such good news, I want to tell this little story. Uh, suppose I'm sitting at uh, the dinner table with my brother, and we're eating pizza that we just ordered, and there's a knock at the door. And my brother gets up, and he goes to the door, and he opens it. He has a little conversation. I don't really know what's going on. I'm just enjoying this pizza. And he turns around, and he comes back, and he sits at the table, and I say, hey, man, what was that all about? And he says, oh, no worries. You forgot to tip the pizza man, and I covered you. Well, in, in response to that free gift from my brother, there'd be some amount of euphoria, right? I'd be, I'd be grateful, right? Because he didn't have to do that and he spotted me five bucks. And I'm thankful for that. Well, imagine the same knock at the door happens or a similar knock. I'm eating pizza. My brother gets up and he goes to the door, has a little conversation, then he comes back to the table. And I say, hey man, what was that all about? And he says, oh, that was the IRS. There were two agents outside and they meant business. They were about to seize your house and all your properties and all your businesses because you owe back taxes for the last 20 years of uh, 50 million dollars. But I paid it for you. Well, you'll see in this illustration that my gratitude for the 50 million dollar debt owed is greater than my gratitude for the five dollar debt owed. Right? It just makes sense. Jesus said it like this, those who are forgiven much love much. Well, Jesus wasn't saying that some people are forgiven more than others. He was saying those who recognize the size of the debt paid will respond more accurately to the, good, to the goodness of the gospel. So if we want to know the cost, what exactly did God do for us? We have to understand the cross. The price that God paid to clear your debt, to clear my debt, was the life of his precious son. And this is epic, guys. You have to understand just how valuable you are to God, that he was willing. He didn't spare his son, but let his son take on the punishment that you deserved, that all of us deserve because of our sin, because that we were dead in sin. There needed to be the shedding of innocent blood. There needed to be a Passover lamb slain. All of those symbols that we talked about, those living pictures in the last video, guys, this pointed to this moment in history on Calvary where the Son of God took on the sin of the world. He was perfect and spotless and pure. He was completely innocent, yet he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And it's a free gift. But to, in order to understand just how cool of a gift that you've gotten, how big of a gift you've gotten, you have to understand the cross, what it cost God to pay your debt. And that's where we meditate on the cross. We, 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 we continually keep the cross 
at the center of our mind. It guides our life because it's such a good gospel. It really is the best news ever. If you understand hell and where you were going and you understand the price that God paid to rescue you, you will not brush it off like a $5 debt that was paid. You will give your entire life for that gospel. Okay, and this is why Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man finds it, he sells everything to go and buy that field. It's like a pearl of great price. And a merchant who, who knows about pearls, he finds this pearl of great price. And when he does, he sells everything he has to go and buy this pearl. Guys, the truth about the kingdom of God and what Jesus has done for us, it's so good that when we really see it and grasp it and get a hold of it, we give away everything. We deny ourselves and we come and follow him. I'll tell you a story at the end of this video that really makes uh, that clear. Let's move on for now. Why the cross? Why did God's plan of redemption look like it looked? Well, this might not be the full answer, but this is a hint towards what the answer is. Uh, remember our story in the garden? Well, God gave human beings dominion over earth. What's a human being? A spirit and a dirt body. Adam and Eve had dominion, which meant that God would not interfere with their free will on earth, that we were in charge. Now, Lucifer is a spirit. He is a rule breaker. He is the father of lies. He doesn't mind to be unfaithful. Everything he says cannot be trusted. So he didn't mind coming in illegally to the earth because he knew that God was faithful. He knew enough about God to know that God would never lie, would never be dishonest. So the moment God gave man dominion, Lucifer, and I'm paraphrasing, Lucifer probably uh, had, the, and I, this is all conjecture, but, but, but follow me here. Lucifer probably had this uh, euphoria saying, oh, I'm going to get you now, God, because you can't come in legally. So, so because you've given man dominion, I'm going to come in and I'm going to destroy what was most precious to you. Well, we know the story. He went in. He was successful to tempt Eve, and he ushered in death. He ushered in sin, which the wages thereof is death. And, and Lucifer probably celebrated in those early moments after the fruit. He probably said in his, in his little prideful heart, I got you, God. I destroyed the thing that was most precious to you. But here's what God said to Lucifer in that promise that we talked about. And I'm paraphrasing, guys, but go read the account. God said, okay, serpent, you're pretty clever. You know, you, you knew I wouldn't come in. You knew that I was too faithful, that I would let them have the freedom to choose and have dominion over the earth. But you forgot that I'll still speak. And that same woman that you deceived, that same woman is going to give me a dirt body. And I'm going to legally come on earth and crush your head. That is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. Jesus' father was from heaven. Perfect blood, the perfect son of God, completely without sin, God's nature, God himself, come down, took on human form, but did not sin, went to the cross. So then what happened at the cross? Remember that story, uh, King David? Well, remember how I mentioned that this king that would come, the Messiah, he would destroy the leader of the enemy force lawfully and remove his head? Well, in David's time, David's covenant, David meditated on his covenant all the time, the penalty for blaspheming the Lord of hosts was to be stoned. And that's exactly what Goliath did. So David put, picked up a rock and took down Goliath. Then David picked up Goliath's own weapon, the sword, and cut off Goliath's head. Well, guys, this is a picture of what our Lord Jesus did. He lawfully did not break any rules, lived completely within the law. In fact, he fulfilled the law. And when death came for Jesus Christ, death broke the rules and took an innocent man. Well, because he did that, Jesus legally took the keys from Satan, took his own weapon, death, and killed, cut off his own head. By death, he killed death. And this is a beautiful picture, guys, of what happened at the cross. It's a spiritual reality that's too big for us, but we can marvel at it and it can bring us to worship. So I want to give you some helpful ways to understand religion versus the gospel. 
When I say the gospel, I'm talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. Religion is kind of like man saying to God, look at all I've done for you. The gospel is God saying to man, look at all I've done for you. Religion is man climbing up to God. The gospel is that God climbed down to man. Religion, it demands righteousness from you. It, de it demands righteousness from man. It says, follow these rules and then you'll be righteous. Well, the gospel, it delivers righteousness to man. You receive God's righteousness as a gift through faith that you did not earn. The re religion is, is largely based on fear, guilt, and shame. And you'll hear this even in Christian churches. They'll beat you up. The shepherds aren't feeding you. They're beating you. They're making you feel guilty. You're just not spiritual enough. You're just not working hard enough. They'll twist scriptures to make you feel like it's your obedience that really makes you justified by God. That, that really saves you. Well, the gospel, it's based on trust, faith, hope, and love. The gospel recognizes that we are not justified by our obedience, but by one man's obedience, we're made righteous. And we put our faith, we put our trust in his sacrifice. And we learn how to love and not fear our Heavenly Father. Religion makes man, and this is the ironic, paradoxical thing, religion actually makes man self-righteous. It's actually the mother of all sins. It makes man prideful. Religious people keep uh, unbelievers out of the church all the time because they're judgmental, hypocritical. And this pride is the, the, the thing that God detests the most. Whereas the gospel actually makes man righteous. The more we understand that it's all grace, that the work's all done and that we didn't earn it, but that we just receive it, the more we stay focused on his finished work, the, the more we actually become, become like him, the more we're transformed into his glory. Essentially, guys, religion is self-focused. It's all about you and your performance. How will you obey? And the gospel is cross-focused. It's all about him and his performance and how well he obeyed. So hopefully those help. Um, at this time, I want to tell that little story. I told you I had a story for you. And this helped me a lot to understand. I heard this. One of my favorite apologists told this story. Um, there's a woman who is a slave and she is in a country that she doesn't speak the language of and she's being auctioned off and there's two men in the crowd that are talking about all these terrible things they're going to do with her when they buy her well an old man hears them and he raises his hand and he offers twice as much money and he buys her right away now he's walking with the woman to the city clerk office and the whole time the woman is cursing at him and spitting at him and trying to kick him. She hates him and she's raging against this old man. The old man walks her all the way to the clerk's office. And at the clerk's office, there's a man, the, the clerk speaks both languages. So the woman says, what is going on here? What's happening? And the clerk says, this man, this old man, he's buying your freedom. This is the story of us guys. The only person that's really trying to help us is the one we're trying to kill, is the one that we are rebelling against. Before we put our faith in Christ, we are fighting against the only person that is really trying to buy our freedom, that really cares about us, that really loves us. Well, what does the woman do when she finds out this news? That, her, uh, that the person that she was just disgracing was actually the only person that loved her and cared for her. Well, she turns and says, old man, I have one question for you. Can I be your slave? And guys, this is the only appropriate response to the gospel. When you understand the debt that was paid to buy your freedom, when you understand the eternity that you've escaped by placing your faith in Christ, that you no longer have to go to hell, that you can enjoy heaven forever, when you understand these realities, the only reasonable response is to turn to the one that set you free and voluntarily become his slave. So I just pray that you guys were blessed in this video. It really is all about Jesus Christ, the man filled with grace and truth. In our next video, we're going to talk about some helpful things to help you understand how to walk out your new life as a Christian. That video is called New Creatures. I pray that you'll check it out.
God bless.